So, hi friends, uh, we are going to see August 2021 Yojana titled Public Administration. So, in that topic, uh, in that Yojana, we are going to see three topics. One is dynamics of civil services, probity in governance, reforms in civil services. The first title is uh, dynamics of civil services. First, we need to understand the term civil services. So, civil services is a group of employees who are in permanent character working for the government. A very basic understanding of the term civil services. So, that will be easy for your uh, understanding of the article. So, we call them populist civil servant bureaucrats, correct? So, very basic understanding of civil servant is a permanent official working for the government. So, here the title is dynamics of civil services and we can go with paragraph 1. So, paragraph 2 and we have points we put that as paragraph 3 all the points first and foremost thing is uh, the first paragraph there is a name of a thinker Max Weber so Max Weber was a German thinker who studied about civil service especially the term bureaucracy so he classified three types of authority one is traditional authority So, traditional authority. Uh, next thing is charismatic authority. And last one is rational legal authority. National legal authority. So, what, what is authority means? Legitimate power. So, in any given society or any given institution, there will be an individual who is able to influence others that you can call it as authority very basic understanding so if you are able to influence others in doing something or to achieve a goal so that we call it as authority very basic common man understanding so that is called legitimate power so in this there are three types of authority given by Max Weber one is traditional authority charismatic authority and legal rational authority okay so and the examples are given so when you say go for traditional authority so in our uh, Indian society we can see that royal families are a good example of traditional authority. So, they are they get, they got that portion of authority based on lineage, bloodline that is one type of authority. Charismatic authority is based on individual charisma that is called charismatic authority. Mostly we can see that in uh, uh, cine world we have fan followings that is based on charisma. Based on movie charisma, we, we follow certain uh, movie stars. That is called charismatic authority. They are able to influence the people. And last one is legal rational authority. That is what Max Weber always suggests for government. So, if, one, if someone want to be an authority, that should be based on legal rational character. So, legal rational character, they are given some points. So, first thing is, uh, so it is it's a Objective and rational, we will see all these things. Objective and rational. Legal rational means objective and rational. So, what is objective and rational means? Under legal rational authority, anyone is a leader. Right now, take example of India or take example of a district collector, SP, they all come under legal rational authority. They are more objective and rational. What is more objective and rational means? Any of the decisions of a district collector or an SP as a common one we have experience of uh, seeing them and interacting with them. Their decisions are entirely based on what we call it as objective and objectivity and rationality. Objectivity means entirely based on information and analysis. So, the other side of that thing is decisions based on emotions. So, mostly in legal rational authority Max Weber suggests that any decision maker that is nothing but any authority a person who enjo enjoys the authority will make the decisions based on information and analysis. So, better way of saying this is uh, right now we can see corona pandemic situations. If you are a district collector, what is the next step need to be done? You go through a report, you go through World Health Organization reports, government ministry of health uh, uh, reports, then based on the findings of your district you make a decision that is called objectivity and rationality very basic thing. Okay. So, in that they have given some uh, basic characters, one is formal selection and promotion that is given in paragraph 2. So, there will be selection and promotion, selection and promotion 
return rules we'll just list out all these things hierarchical structure hierarchical structure specialization i'll list out and explain all these points to give a basic understanding of the civil service then we can understand the other articles of this uh, uh, yojana professionalism career orientation so these are the points these are the character what max weber says for a civil services one is selection and promotion is entirely based on merit so right now we can see indian civil service examination is based on merit based selection you need to clear the examination anyone can write the examination if you clear the examination you are given the services that's a merit based selection to understand this process we need to compare with the other authorities it can be a traditional authority or charismatic authority where merit is not given importance right now if you are in a royal family you are given a position based on birth not based on your merit just for understanding purpose so legal rational authority first important aspect is selection and promotion is based on merit next thing is all the actions in legal rational authority is based on written rules so if you take example of our indian civil services you can see that officials always quoting that as per rules so if you are an authority your actions in civil services is not based on your likes and dislikes it is entirely based on rules what the rule says you want to follow it it has a negative impact also we'll see that the next thing is hierarchical structure what is hierarchical structure means the entire civil service have levels of authority so if you take state level uh, 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 district level it start with the district collector and it ends at the lowest level of vao village administrative officer that's called hierarchy levels of authority these are all given by max weber the next thing is specialization and division of labor and responsibilities right now if you take a indian civil service there are various services we have administrative services police services revenue services this is a good example of specialization to run a government there should be an a person who are very good in policing an official that that should be a person who is very good in revenue that should be a person who is very good in audit so this is a specialization so that is what max weber also says for legal rational authority there is a specialization the next thing is professionalism so every job have a professional character right now if you take police services that is the reason for training why after getting into services once you got into the list there is a training for two and half years especially for ias ips and all because they want to create this professional character in you if you are in a police service officer they want to imbibe the professionalism in you as an officer how you want to behave how you want to be a professional so right from your uh, physique mental attitude and your body language all are being trained to match the professionalism okay so that is another most important character and then is career orientation so another most important character of this legal rational uh, civil services your entire professional career can be spent in that organization so that is another reason why you want to get into civil services once you get into civil services another 30 years you can be in the job when you compare with traditional authority or charismatic authority that's not a possibility so when now there's a change in power assume that whenever a new king comes to the throne he'll throw away all the official because even though previous king may be a father the new king thinks that okay these officials are loyal to my father they will not be loyal to me so they will throw it out similarly charismatic authority but if we take india as an example whenever there's a change in the leadership either it can be a prime minister or chief minister you can see that civil servant is not losing a job that's called career orientation so that is another most important character of uh, civil services so this is all given by Ma max uh, weber what makes civil services especially when you say civil services means legal rational uh, civil services okay and uh, there are some issues in it based on this character there are some issues in that we'll see paragraph 1 and also we have some paragraph 2 aspect so what the issue is this is given by lord acton so lord is a term which is always given for uh, people in uk so so the bureaucracy of uk can be related to india also because uh, the bureaucracy or civil services what we have in india is nothing but what left by britishers because britishers ruled india for 200 years so they created an administrative structure which we are using right now so what are the things said for uk 
can also be applied for India. That is the reason why we are seeing this. So, he says power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is the most important term we need to relate. So, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So, what we need to understand from this term is or from the statement is what Lord Acton says this is related to civil services. We know that we have an authority. Authority is nothing but legitimate power. So, when we say this legitimate power what Lord Acton says one of the negative impact of civil services once you give a person a power or an authority right now assume if you are a district collector there are greater chance that that can end in corruption. So, what is corruption is very layman understanding misusing your authority that is called corruption. What are the example of misusing the authority means? So, take a situation once you get into civil services uh, as an IAS officer as a district collector government provides you, provides you a car that is for official purpose for your official transportation you need to use the car. But if that is used for your personal reasons or for family reasons that is called corruption very basic understanding. So, that is what Lord Acton says power corrupts. So, there are greater chance that if a person is given power corruption will happen. Absolute power corrupts absolutely what the next uh, statement says is if that power is absolute absolute means assume that he is given all the power in the organization and there is a greater chance that absolute corruption can happen that power can be entirely misused for their own well being. So, that is a, a statement we need to understand a great way of understanding this is uh, so we can see that uh, right now taking in uh, international affairs right now what is happening in Russia where Russian president is considered to be the most ultimate power absolute power and there are uh, reports saying that he is uh, misusing his power for his personal likes. So, that can be absolute corruption so that statement we can relate with civil service also. Okay. So, and uh, so another statement is also given saying that responsibility without power. So, responsibility, so responsibility without power, I will say all these things responsibility without power, without outcome and that is failure to achieve the goal. So, now other extreme is other extreme is uh, as he said that power can corrupt the system. If you give too much of power to civil servant ultimately that can results in corruption based on that fear if you are not giving power ultimately what happens this is an next statement says responsibility without power what is responsibility means as a civil servant they need to do lot of activities for the welfare of the society for those activities they need to have a power they need to have some authority. If that authority is not given ultimately what happens the civil service cannot achieve the goals because they are not the decision maker. So, they need to do lot of activities but if they are not the decision maker means ultimately the process gets slowed and organization or civil service cannot reach the goals. So, that is the next statement. So, there should be a fine balance between how to give the power and how to balance the outcome. So, power should not corrupt and also ultimately power should be right enough to achieve the goals. So, that is what striking a balance uh, and Indian civil service they always try to strike the balance. So, that is given in uh, paragraph 1 and paragraph 2. So, professionalism. So, we saw that uh, one of the important character of uh, civil service is professionalism. So, professionalism. So, it consists of four important characters one is uniformity, neutrality, efficiency and anonymity. I will say all these words what are all this stands for. So, right now if you are in civil services what are the most important professional characters these three four these four four characters uniformity, neutrality, efficiency and anonymity. What is uniformity means as a civil servant in a society you want to make sure that 
everyone is treated uniform there is no differences that's called uniformity so you should not see the people in various perspectives or various lenses so take example of india india has so much of diversity based on religion caste gender so if you are in civil service you want to make sure that everyone is a equal for you everyone is indian citizen you should not differentiate them okay what is neutrality if you are in civil services make sure that you are not politically aligned you can have your political orientation so you can as an voter you have an opinion about a party beyond that voter you should not be in civil services supporting a party so that's called neutrality the next thing is efficiency efficiency is nothing but how effectively you are using the public resources so it's more about uh, quantity terms efficiency says that if a government money is given to you how efficiently using that money to get the outputs so that's called efficiency and finally anonymity anonymity is the most important character of a civil services whatever you achieve you cannot take the credit that's called anonymity so these are some of the most important professional character of civil services so this is the basic background of what civil services in this article so it will be easy for us to understand the other articles the next article is probity in governance so so what is governance means in any society especially for development how decisions are made that is called governance okay very basic understanding and what is probity means so probity is nothing but how you follow the value systems especially moral values in that decision making process that's called probity in governance this is the most important thing for a civil servant okay so in that we we'll go for paragraph 1 so paragraph 2 so paragraph 3 and paragraph 4 so paragraph 1 so there's a term called ethics so in probity we have ethics so so ethics is nothing but set of standards so if you are in civil services there are certain principles or standards which you need to follow that's called ethics and where it helps us helps to guide the behavior choices actions so this seems to be very philosophical to understand so what is ethics is set of principles you need to follow in civil services why you need to follow the set of principles is which helps your behavior so if you are a civil servant how you want to behave then how you want to make your choices so as a civil servant to solve a problem there will be different choices in front of you so you want to choose one that is being guided by this ethical values the next thing is actions how you want to put your choices into actions again that comes the ethics so that is called our value systems to give you to understand all this thing is assume that you are a person you never want to support corruption so you always stand with the value of integrity <clears throat> so that comes the concept of behavior so as a civil servant you are a person who never accepts money so you have a very good behavior choices so choice is nothing but if you are allocating a tender you are going to allocate the tender based on merit not based on corruption and actions ultimately you can see that all your actions in civil service is guided by this integrity not influenced based on money especially corrupt money so that's the importance of ethics okay so it's a multi dimensional governed by the value system of the society and this value systems so i said ethics is a set of principles and values this values is influenced by lot of other aspects rights obligations rights obligation fairness so these are some of the values which influence the ethics and ethics in civil service is multi dimensional multi dimensional means there are various factors contributing for the ethics so they have given some of the things it can be a right on obligation law says what need to be done rights it can be human rights or rights given in the constitution fairness virtues correct so all this have a biggest role in determining the ethics and another thing is ethics and probity is the cornerstone of 
public administration. So ethics right now we saw and what is this probity is nothing but high with moral values. So all this combination makes the foundation stone for public administration. So when you are running a civil services, it should be entirely based on ethics and probity. Probity is nothing but high moral values. So without that, if you are creating any civil services, it is always going to fail. So that is given in paragraph 1. Next thing is paragraph 2. So in paragraph 2, they have given some examples. So right now to promote ethics in administration. So they have given some examples in countries like UK, UK, Canada, Spain. So, so they also given their uh, initiative there, correct? Code of conduct and ethics for ministers. So, code of conduct and ethics for ministers, legislatures and civil servants. This is in UK. They have given a code of conduct and ethics. If you are a legislature, if you are an MP in UK or if you are a civil servant in UK, there are codes given to you which you need to follow in your job. Similarly, if you go for uh, uh, Canada, that is a uh, guide for ministers. So, guide for minister, it is nothing but ethics, how, what a minister need to follow. The next thing is uh, code of good governance for ministers. So, code of good governance for ministers and senior officers. This is in Spain and similarly in uh, US, they have code of conduct. So, in US, they have this code of conduct for Senate. So, in most of the democracies, why we are listing out all this thing is most of the Western democracies where we borrowed the concept of democracies, they have this code of conduct and ethics for public servants. Either it can be a minister or it can be a civil servant. All they need to follow this in their job profile. So, that is given in paragraph 2, some examples. And paragraph 3, they have given the origin of the term ethics. So, ethics came from Greek word ethikos, Greek word that is ethikos which says arising from habit, arising from habit, arising from habit correct and uh, it is more cultural character sense of right and wrong. So, ultimately what they say is ethics is nothing but how you have the habit and whether that habit is suitable for civil service or not. That is called ethics. Okay. So, that is given in paragraph 3 and also, so another thing is when they say ethics in public services, ethics in public services, it is not only about the moral values, it is not about only the moral values, it is more about holding public servants accountable. So, there are two dimensions of it. So, what is this uh, aspect is when we say ethics in civil services, it is not only think, uh, saying that there is some code of ethics which you need to follow. That is only one side of the coin and what the author of this article says is the other side of the coin is make sure that you are making them accountable. What is accountable means you want to check whether the values or ethics is being followed or not. If that is not being done, what are the corrective actions being taken? So, it is it is not only identifying the ethics, it is also enforcing the ethics. So, that is the two dimensions which we need to keep in mind. So, ethics in civil service is not only identifying what are the values of the ethics, also how to implement it. If there is a violation, what are the punishments being given? That is given in paragraph 3. So, and paragraph 4. So, it is a uh, quotation says the lack of moral earnest which has been a conspicuous feature of recent years perhaps the greatest single factor which hampers the growth of a strong tradition of integrity and efficiency. So, what they say is in paragraph 4, so there is lack of moral values especially in public services. So, if there is one civil servant or a minister they lack this moral values ultimately resulting in poor efficiency poor efficiency and integrity. So, this clearly shows that for a development of a society who are considered to be the major factors, the civil servants and ministers who play a major role in the development of the society, if they do not have the moral values, 
if they are not ethically correct ultimately that impacts our development so there will be a poor efficiency and also lack of integrity resulting in corruption okay so that's a uh, quotation says here so next thing is paragraph 1 so paragraph 2 so paragraph 3 so in paragraph 1 adherence to key principles of integrity honesty and objectivity promotes trust and confidence among stakeholders so first we need to know what is stakeholders means stakeholders means in any society when now a, a government makes a decision who are all going to get the impact of the decision they are called as stakeholders so which includes people which includes other government departments which includes business people or all part of stakeholders so in whenever government make a decision it has an impact on the entire society and what they say is in civil services or in public services whenever the principles of integrity that is integrity means following the right path not involving corruption honesty and objectivity honesty in your dealing so whatever you say people on the other side can strongly believe that you are giving the right information you are not any manipulating anything and objectivity all your in informations and decisions are influenced based on analysis so these are the key important principles and what this paragraph says is once you have all these things in civil service as a principle which increases the credibility increase the credibility means if you are a civil servant when you follow all these principles other stakeholders it can be a per, it can be a common man it can be a your colleague other fellow government employee or it can be a businessman they strongly believe you that's called credibility okay so to enhance credibility these are the things need to be followed okay the next thing is in paragraph 2 so they have given a list of things ecosystem of ethics so when you want to create a very good ethics for civil services what are the ecosystem what are the necessary conditions one is culture so any society culture need to always focus on ethics the next thing is values the culture need to promote this values honesty the next thing is avoiding conflict of interest i'll give some example for all this what is the culture aspect is uh, right now take example of indian society why there is lot of corruption why civil servant or a uh, uh, politician is highly corrupt is because of cultural values in our indian society what is cultural values in indian society is right now in our indian society no one is ready to ask what is the source of money so if someone is becoming rich so in our indian culture we are always enjoying that individual saying that he is successful person but the culture in our indian society never asked this question so as a culture in our indian society we never asked this question how you got this money so ultimately what people is thinking is we want to become rich that means can be anything it's not only based on legal means it can also be based on illegal means that's called cultural aspect so if you want to have ethics especially in civil service in a society the ecosystem need to be there that's called culture and value society should have this values of honesty and uh, integrity the next thing is conflict of interest what is conflict of interest means if you are a public servant so conflict of interest means assume that you are going to give a tender that should not be given to a family member so these are some of the aspects that's called ecosystem so ecosystem of ethics the next thing is legal and administrative framework so when you want to promote ethics it's not only based on this three characters and next thing is legal and administrative framework based on this background you want to create this code of conduct for ministers civil servants prevention of corruption act you need to have an act if something is wrong, uh, wrong is being done what is the punishment right information act all these are there in india that's called legal framework so legal framework the next thing is institutional framework so institutional framework is there are certain organization to check all the things are going in the right direction like lok aayukta cvc cba these are institutions created in india so when you want to have a very good ethics in civil services especially in governance process these are three conditions one is there should be ecosystem of ethics next thing is 
administrative and legal framework and institutional framework all this need three to be sandwiched then only we can get a proper probity in governance okay that's given in paragraph 2 and paragraph 3 so they also given other conditions one is codifying ethical norms and practices what is codifying means creating a rules so there are certain very good ethical practices we are, we are following for generations so that should be codified that should be made as a law the next thing is disclosing personal interest to avoid conflict that is what conflict of interest and creating a mechanism to enforcing the relevant codes once you create a code you want to have a mechanism to enforce it the next thing is there should be some norms for qualifying and disqualifying public functionaries from the office if someone seems to be corrupt they should be removed from the office so all this need to be there these are other conditions so one is codifying so codifying laws and so cod codifying ethical norms so this becomes law and next thing is uh, disclosing their interest so disclosing their interest the next thing is mechanism for enforcing those codes and disqualifying so disclose disqualifying public officials public functionaries so please understand for all this we have an in india mechanisms there is a theoretical thing what need to be done okay uh, next thing is uh, next para paragraph says value serves as a guiding star showing the path to all members of society and follow them so why we need to codify this this is the reason why they have given why need to we need to codify the ethical norms of values codifying is nothing but uh, writing a written uh, uh, principle saying that if you are in civil service you want to follow all these things why that need to be done is or else ultimately that creates confusion in interpreting the thing if it's not being codified if it is not written if it is not properly saying what need to be done ultimately the interpretation changes for the people to avoid that we need to codify that's the reason it's given in the next paragraph so to avoid avoid misinterpretation so given example of all this thing is uh, so assume take religion as an example so we can see that in islam or uh, christianity take example of islam there's a quran which says that if you are following islamic faith quran ultimately says that in any given day if you are a staunch islam islamic follower five days you need to go for namaz so that's given there as a part of uh, sharia law and quran it's given there it's very well codified whereas if you take example of hinduism there is no such written things saying that if you are a hindu you need to go for temple each day it's not written there it depends upon the people so ultimately we can see in a given family father goes to the temple every day where a son does not go so if there is no codification sometimes it can be resulting in different interpretation so that need to be just giving an example from uh, religious context to understand don't take it in wrong wrong sense okay so uh, that is there and next thing is paragraph this paragraph 4 and next thing is paragraph 5 so public office should be treated trust which impose lot of responsibilities okay accountable to society so what they say is uh, public office this public office can be a minister or a civil servant which comes with lot of responsibilities so they want to do lot of activities in society and well being of the people assume if you are a minister so you are responsible for people well being and you are responsible for the society lot of things are there that's called responsibilities and once you have this lot of responsibilities automatically you are accountable what is accountable means you are answerable so if you are a minister you know that if you are a prime minister if you are a ch chief minister you are answerable for the entire society why you are answerable is because you have lot of responsibilities especially that is related to the people's life that is what the uh, paragraph says the next thing is paragraph 6 and uh, integrity another most important requirement of public servants so integrity in public offices so integrity in public offices so if you are to be integrant you need to give due diligence 
so what is due diligence means whatever the actions you do in public services you should put the right effort to know what is happening in that particular issue or particular activity then you need to decide on the things you should not go you should not take anything very lightly on the go you should not do anything you should put all your effort to understand the issue and make additions or make corrective actions that's called due, due diligence you should not take it anything lightly and uh, that is the reason and uh, and honesty next thing is honesty in dealing with government resources so when government is giving the resources to you because as a civil servant government will provide you lot of resources it can be human resources financial resources government will put under your disposal so you should be honestly using that resources for the public welfare you should not use it for your personal interest assume that in a personal assistant is given to you by the government as a district collector that personal assistant should be honestly used for the purpose of the government functions not for your personal interest okay so these are all part of paragraph 6 okay this paragraph 7 8 9 Okay. So, in paragraph seven, so government of India. So, right now in government of India, we have code of conduct. So, code of conduct for ministers, both at union level, both at union level and state government level. So, that is given here. so what they say is uh, uh, so they should not be involved any uh, connection with any businesses and uh, any family member should not be involved in there are something given like that so that's code of conduct so a simple way of saying code of conduct is what are the do's and don'ts so if you are a minister what are things you can do as a minister what are things you should not do as a minister that's called do's and don'ts so so one thing they say is if you are uh, if you are a minister you should not be in business activities and your family should member should not be in business it is a logical one correct because government is going to spend a lot of money in different areas and if you are a minister you can give all that projects to your company what you own so to avoid that's already we saw the term called conflict of interest so that should be avoided that's one code of conduct the next thing is uh, code of conduct is evolved during time that is given there and also we have for civil services so in pay paragraph 8 so based on santanam committee so this is a committee formed by our government santanam committee so based on that committee recommendation in india they have created this created this civil service rules civil service conduct rules okay civil service conduct rules 1964 still that is being followed today So again, we can see this code of conduct for civil servants. That was based on the recommendation of the Santanam Committee, a committee formed in India to modernize the civil services. Okay. So they have given some of the examples here. So some of the examples in paragraph nine for uh, conduct of uh, civil servant. If you are a, a district collector or if you are an IAS, IPS officer, how you want to behave. So they have given that as. Uh, uh, prohibiting or uh, demanding or accepting dowry if you are a civil servant you should not accept dowry that is part of this uh, civil service rules correct and the prohibition of employing children below 14 years of age there is a culture in india especially we can see that uh, employing younger children in your homes so that need to be avoided if you are a civil servant that is again part of this uh, conduct rules they have given listed some of the examples that's it that is paragraph 9 so not to accept dowry So not accept dowry, correct? And next thing is, uh, so not to employ children, child below fourteen years. So these are some of the rules given. There are a lot of other rules are there. Just to represent it, even they have given something like this. So okay. And uh, so they also given if there is any violation that's given in paragraph 10 if there is any violation there are penalties that is major penalties so major penalties and minor penalties what is major penalty logically you will be asked to uh, go out of the job major penalties so minor penalties may be for example uh, 
they will give you a memo or they de-promote all this stuff happens. So, that is given in paragraph 10. Uh, next thing is paragraph 11, 12, 14 and 15. So, in paragraph 11, So, right now what is the other biggest finding of this uh, civil service conduct rules is especially in implementation it is time consuming civil service conduct rules especially if there is any violation it is always time consuming in consuming in giving penalty that is a finding of Indian system though we have the civil service conduct rules and uh, they say that as a civil servant you want to follow all these things. But if there is any violation is that instant punishment is given that is not the reality. So, it takes longer time. So, what we need to understand is the real impact of this civil service conduct rules is not immediate. Okay, That is given pa paragraph uh, 11. Next in paragraph 12. So, why we need to have this probity? So, why we need to have this uh, moral values and ethics and governance is ultimately that results in efficient and effective system. What is efficient and effective system is the difference between quantity and quality. So, quantity you know, quality you know, correct. So, what is quantity means assume that uh, how many toilets are being constructed under Swachh Bharat that is called quantity. What is the usage of the toilets that is called quality. So, when you have this probity in governance, integrity and high moral values in governance, you can achieve both the things efficiency and effectiveness. So, that is the importance of this probity and uh, both ethics and probity are intertwined or uh, both are interlinked that is given in paragraph 12 and paragraph 13. So, good governance paragraph 13 good governance. So, we saw what is governance means correct decision making. So, good governance is nothing but if all these decisions are made with good value systems that is called good governance. So, and good governance is based on trust and confidence whose trust and confidence the stakeholders. So, every stakeholders need to have trust and confidence on each other ultimately that results in good governance. Okay. So, what is the outcome of this probity in governance? So, when you have probity in governance, so what the outcome is resulting in accountability. So, when you have probity in governance resulting in accountability that is answerability by public servants, transparency. So, everyone knows what is happening in the system. The next thing is integrity, integrity. So, to achieve this probity in governance, so we have this frameworks institutional and legal framework that is given in this tabular column. So, institutional wise we have this central vigilance commission that is called CVC, we have the CBI central bureau of investigation, we have CAG competent and auditor general, Lokpal and Lokayakta. These are the institutions which are enhancing probity in governance or ethics in public life. These are the institutional mechanisms. Next thing is law. So, we have this Binami Transaction Prohibition Act, Prevention of Corruption Act, IPC, CRPC, Right to Information Act. Based on this act, you are also, also able to enhance this probity in governance. So, Prevention of Corruption Act ultimately clearly understand it, correct? So, if someone is involved in corruption what need to be done? If someone is violating this probity in governance what need to be done? So, Binami Transaction Act we always have this term so in our society very loosely Binami is correct on someone's name property is being held. So, mostly that is being done based on corrupt money. So, there is an act to control it. So, all these are the acts to enhance probity in governance. The next thing is what are other ways of uh, enhancing probity in governance is given in paragraph 14. It is nothing but minimizing discretionary in various functions. What is discretion aspect is as a civil servant there are times where you can make your own decisions. It is not possible to have rules and regulation for all situations. So, there are certain areas where government says you can make your own decisions. So, as government work is becoming very larger and larger every day. So, government gives most of the activities under discretionary power that is a scope for corruption. So, that should be minimized that is given there. So, that is uh, to minimize discretion. So, minimize discretion. And next thing is use of information technology. 
So right now in public services, we need to use information technology. What is the advantage of information technology is, if every action is based on ICT, information and communication technology, in layman terms, if government, in government they are using computers. What is the greatest advantage in that thing is, as a common man, by a click of a mouse, you can get government information, we know what is happening there, there will be a greater transparency, right? So that is the greatest advantage there. So that is the next thing we need to do apart from all this uh, institutions and legal framework. The next thing is citizen charter. So citizen charter is nothing but empowering citizens. So all government departments need to make a promise to citizens what need to be done. If there is a violation, what are the actions can be taken? That is all part of citizen charter. So all these are the other activities to enhance the probity and governance. And finally, last one, George Bernard Shah says we must make the world honest before we can honestly say to our children that honesty is the best policy. So what he says, this quotations why we are highlighting here is if possible we can use it in your essay writing of mains examination or you can use it as an introduction for your mains answers. So what uh, George Bernatcha says, uh, yeah important personality of Britain. When you say that honesty is there in a society to our children, first that should be prevailing there. So, we need to have the practice of honesty, then we can say to the children that we need to follow honesty. So, that is given in this last statement. Okay. Next thing is reforms in civil services. So, when you take this reform in civil services, so the title itself says civil service need to be revamped because when our society changes, government's work changes, ultimately civil service also need to change. So, there comes the term called reform. Okay. So they'll in the we'll go for paragraph one, two, three, four. So in paragraph one, they say what is civil service means. So public service is different from civil service. So civil service is nothing but permanent executive branch of government. So, what is permanent executive is, please understand civil service means it consists of employees who will be permanent in character. They will be in the service for 30 years, 40 years based on their age they enter into services and based on the retirement age. And it is executive branch. Executive branches, government have various aspects, owners legislature, making laws and implementation of laws. Implementation of laws is taken care by civil services, that is that's the reason it is called as executive branch all the laws made by the government is being implemented that we call as executive branch. So, civil service is permanent in character and responsible for policy execution. Okay. And also it is called as backbone of India, civil service called as backbone of India. So, what is this term backbone of India means especially for India as a country to survive, India as a country to develop especially socio-economically, civil service is considered to be the primary requirement. Without civil service, India cannot develop. That is the point they have given in paragraph 1 and paragraph 2. So, they have said ministry, ministers decide the policy and civil servant who is going to implement the policy. That is what they call as executive branch, correct? So, ministers responsible for policy making. It can be socio-economic policies and civil servants policy execution. So, they are responsible for policy execution. And Article 311, so there is a reference of Article 311 of Indian Constitution. So, Article 311 of Indian Constitution says that civil servants need to be protected from the political masters. So, literally you can see that uh, politician lifetime is 5 years, civil servants will be for another 30, 40 years. So, a so, uh, politician want to make sure that civil servant work for his interest. So, to avoid that, this article 311 is there and what I will give a glimpse of what, what is article 311 is, this is regarding resignation, removal and reduction of rank of civil servants, where the article says this can be done only by appointing authority. So, uh, no one can easily remove a civil servant. So, that is, it is a simple way of saying in layman term is that nothing but job security. So, article 311 promises job security for civil servants, okay, that is given in paragraph 2. And paragraph 3, so modern day civil service of India trace backs to Mekkale report. 
so so mekala report this during british times so during british times based on mekala report they created this indian civil services so what we need to understand is the civil service of india origin trace back to british times britishers was a colonial power they came from europe is a trader and ruled india for 200 years for that time they created an administrative setup based on this mekala report that is what we are using today so uh, the indian civil service origin we can relate with britishers that is given in paragraph 3 so after uh, that is after independence post independence that is given in paragraph 3 also correct so so Brit we still have this british uh, system correct one is uh, permanent character so permanent character merit based selection so this is again the same character what we saw in the first article so what britishers has created this permanent character of civil service merit based selection even in today of indian civil service we have the same thing that is given there and paragraph 4 so so modern day civil service that is modern day means post independence civil service is based on part 14 of constitution and also based on all india service act 1951 these are the two basic foundation on which modern day civil service is being created one is based on part 14 of indian constitution another thing is based on all india civil service act of 1951 okay a very factual one just basic understanding the next thing is uh, paragraph 1 and 2 so so by the year of 2015 so year of 2015 and 2016 so in a indian system they have given a permission for creating indian skill development services like audit services like police services administrative services 2015 they have given a permission for indian skill development services similarly indian enterprise development services these are the new services being uh uh formulated and another thing is right now we also by 2019 these are all factual information just to give the aspect of civil service reforms 2019 we have this indian railway management services these are the new creation of civil services like indian administrative services police services indian police services indian revenue services by 2015 we have this indian skill development services 2016 indian enterprise development services 2019 indian railway management services so all these are being created newly by, by our uh, indian system this all we call it as this all we can put in one term what we called as structural reforms structural reforms okay the next thing is paragraph 2 okay so what are the primary purpose of reforming civil services so purpose of reform so why you want to reform civil services there are primary reason is to make them dynamic efficient efficient and accountable then along with this like values of integrity impartiality which we already saw under professionalism correct impartiality and neutrality so why we want to do civil service reform is first and foremost thing we may we want to make civil service dynamic so dynamic is nothing but making the civil service responding to the environment they should be more agile more flexible so we have to take example of this new service is being created there's a demand for india for skill development so they created a service that's become very dynamic character and efficient so they want to be more efficient in doing things and also accountable along with the values they want need to be for integrity impartiality neutrality so all these are the primary reason why you want to reform the civil services that's given in paragraph 2 so next we go for this paragraph 1 and paragraph 
So we need to know what are the existing problems of our civil services. So that is given in paragraph 1. That is problems of civil services. Then we can understand the reason for reforms, correct? There are problems given in Indian civil services. One is poor capacity building. Poor capacity building means our, our civil service is not able to provide the needed people, services and products because they don't have the capacity. Simple way of understanding is take example of police stations. Right now, crimes are moving towards cyber era. But if you go for the police station, they don't have the capacity to serve that type of issues, correct? So they don't have computers, they don't have the knowledge that's called poor capacity building, okay? The next thing is inefficient incentive systems. So if you go for any private jobs, if someone is performing, so incentive systems are created. That incentive is nothing but take example of recognition. In private jobs, someone is doing something unique, they are being easily spotted and they are being recognized. But in government jobs, that's not happening. There's a problem in civil services. That's the second point. Third one is outmoded rules and procedures. So ultimately, we can see that civil service of India were created by Britishers. Still, that rules are there, which is not serving our current interest. Because British primary objective of ruling India is to exploit India. But still, that rules are there in modern day India, which is not suitable for India. That's called outmoded rules. Uh, next thing is systematic inconsistency in promotion and empanel empanelment. What is the uh, aspect of promotion is? Promotion is not based on our merit character. It's more about the political connections. So that creates a trouble in our civil services. People with the merit is not being promoted. It's more about political connections. The next thing is lack of adequate transparency and accountability. So in our government system, most of the time, common man doesn't know what is happening inside the government. That's called lack of transparency and accountability. Okay. The next thing is uh, arbitrary whimsical transfers. So ultimately what happens in civil services, most of the time a civil servant is being transferred a lot, especially by the political pressure. This makes civil service aligned more to the political interest rather than people interest. So next thing is political interferences. Ultimately we can see that if you are a district collector, you want to give a contract, you want to do it based on merit. But ultimately, we can see that minister calling up you and saying that give this contract to my relative or my party member or to a known contractor. That's called political interferences. That's again part of uh, civil services. The next thing is uh, dominant of few allied services. Now, Indian system, we can see that uh, those civil services, we say uh, administrative services, police services, revenue services. But still in Indian system, we can see that administrative services, the dominant services, which overshadow other services. So that is also another trouble in our services. These are some of the problems they listed out. We will see the reason why we want to see these problems. Okay, some UPSC questions are based on it. Okay. The next thing is uh, so problems of civil services. Next thing is paragraph 2. So that is given there uh, most of the coveted position. Covered portion is nothing but important portions in government. Important portion means I'll say there's a portion called secretary. So there's important portion in civil service called secretary. And most of the time in India we can see that secretary is a portion is taken by Indian Administrative Services, IAS. But if you logically think it's not that for every secretary we need to have an IAS. Take example, there's a portion called finance secretary. And this secretary majorly deals with financial characters of government, which is taken care by Indian Administrative Services, who is not an expert on finance. Similarly, we have this Home Secretary. Home Secretary is the person responsible for law and order in India. As an IAS officer, he, he may not be an expert on law and order issues. So that is the point they have said here in paragraph 2. Okay, these are some basic problems of our civil services. So. So based on that context, so what happened is Niti Aayog, so it's, I will go for paragraph 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. So in paragraph 1, so Niti Aayog, this is an institution in India responsible for reforming entire Indian system. So they have given st strategy for new India at 75. 
So, there is a report given by Niti Aayag how to make new India. New India is a term we need to keep in mind. They want to create some new vibrant India. Okay. So, they have said that there should be a reform in recruitment, training and performance evaluation of civil services. So, ultimately what this report says is there should be a reform in civil services. So, in what are the areas of civil service need to be reformed is first one is recruitment. How to recruit people there should be a reform. The next thing is training. How to train them there should be a reform and performance evaluation. So, how to evaluate their performance there should be a reform. So, these are the things what they recommended to the government. Civil service should be reformed in three major areas. One is how to recruit them, how they are getting the job that should be a reform in it, how to train them and how to evaluate them. If someone is doing a job yearly how to evaluate them that should be reformed. So, these are the three major areas they said by Niti Aayog that is been given in paragraph 1. So, in paragraph 2 based on that idea, so government came out with this reform in training mission karma yogi. So, mission karma yogi program is essentially based on training. So, civil service training reforms is done under mission karma yogi and what the primary objective of this thing is to make civil servant creative. So, so, what government says is or the objective of this mission karma yogi that is training of civil servant is to make them creative, constructive, constructive, imaginative, innovative, innovative, proactive. So, I am just writing some of the words professional, transparent, technology enabled correct. So, what Indian government says is under mission karma yogi if someone has done the training they have all these characters right from creative to technology enabled. This we need to relate with the previous uh, page where we can see the problems of civil services. So, to address all these problems the training is being changed okay right from creative to technology enabled okay and what are the next paragraph says is paragraph 3. So, there are 4.6 million central government employees. So, 1 million is 10 lakh. So, 4.6 million central government employees. Central government employees he is going to immensely benefit out of this mission Karma Yogi. And they are focused more on governance, performance and accountability. And these are some of the catchy words from rules to rules and from silos to coordination, I will say what all these things are coordination. And next thing is uh, capacity building, capacity building. So, what uh, this uh, mission Karmi Yogi's uh, uh, primary importance is, if someone has finished the training under Mission Karmi Yogi, they are more focused on roles. What type of actions they will do, they will not giving more importance to rules. Already we see that rules is an important character of civil services. Sometimes this creates lot of trouble in providing the benefits to the people because they will be more quoting the rules which will be hindrance for the people. So, what this training says is based on this training you are going to give more importance for roles rather than rules rules become secondary more important is what type of activities you are going to do. Second is from silos to coordination what is silos means mostly government department is all under specialization in the first uh, uh, article. Specialization they work in specific departments then they behave, become isolated. So, they want to get coordinated that is being there and capacity building to enhance their capacity to meet the new challenges. So, this is the primary reason for this mission Karmi Yogi. So, in paragraph 4. So, the Another important aspect of this mission Karmi Yogi is they want to make citizen centric civil services. What is citizen centric civil services means the entire civil service always need to work for the citizen. It is not that they need to work for the political interest, they does not need to need to work for the rules and regulations. To avoid all these things we need to have citizen centric uh, civil services correct. And and they also focus more on behavioral changes. To achieve this we need to have behavioral changes. Who
post behavioral changes is regarding civil servants so all these are taken care by mission karmi yogi so what mission karmi yogi says is under this training module there will be behavioral changes to the civil servant they will be more focused on citizen so as a common man if we interact with the uh, civil servants especially top officials we can see that we have a feeling that they are not taking care of us so to avoid that in training module they are making some behavioral changes for trainings are based on that okay and similarly in paragraph 5 so we have this national program so national program for civil service capacity building so under this mission karma yogi program so we have this national program for civil service capacity building so ultimately they want to build up the capacity of civil servants either it can be based on technology learning indian culture and also learning from outside of the world so if you want to build the capacity of a civil servant either you give them the technology so that they'll be more productive also they can learn the culture so they'll be more sensitive to the needs of the people that's capacity building and also learning from other countries so for that only we have this igot platform what is igot is integrated government online training so integrated government online training platform so where we can integrate with global countries to get the modules of training so that they can enhance their capacity okay and also we have this capacity building commission so p6 paragraph 6 says about capacity building commission it's a institution for strengthening this program commission okay and also they want to standardize the standardize the uh, training modules faculties resources and also they want to supervise all the central training institution we have different training institutions for police services uh, administrative services revenue services to build the capacity of all this tra training institutes we have this capacity building commissions so that is given in this page next thing is paragraph 1 and paragraph 2 so in paragraph 1 they have given about this igot platform so so it's a uh, it says world class for content world first content and e learning so online platform so it's online platform uh, what government says is based on this online platform a person doesn't need to visit the training institutes and also based on this online platform they can get world class content so if you are a civil servant your training can be standardized or it can be marked along with global standards and also e learning platform there is a greatest advantage as a civil servant if you are posted in nagaland it doesn't mean that you want to go for some training institutes in delhi based on e learning you can learn all these things that's the advantage of this igot platform and also apart from this what they are saying is uh, based on this igot platform government is planning to extend beyond training so once you have this uh, igot platform you can also map individual civil servants so for example what are the courses you have taken so ultimately though they know that you are an expert on these domains so that can results in focusing on deployment assignments performance appraisal promotions so government is thinking in larger perspective of creating this platforms so once you get training in this platforms they'll have a track of every individual civil servants they know where they are being trained which area they are being expert based on that job profile can be given based on that performance appraisal can be given ultimately you say that rule based to role based that is what the intention of this training module that is what I, igot platform is okay in paragraph 2 so they have given support transition from rule to role based hr management correct and uh, on site learning to complement side with off site learning so some of the important aspect is uh, role based uh, next thing is uh, on site learning so these are some of the important character of this uh, uh, mission karmi yogi and next thing is uh, <coughs> so ecosystem for shared learning so all central training institutes or training institute at state level they can share the resources which can be utilized by all civil servants that is given there correct 
and next thing is uh, they have given framework of roles activities and competencies approach for civil servants for civil servants and ultimately that results in making the civil servant more efficient and effective uh, next thing is uh, behavioral changes so behavioral and domain competencies so based on mission karma yogi if someone is trained in that they are getting all these benefits here correct uh, next thing is uh, 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 so co 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 creation of co creation of training contents by training institutes that can be done and also best in learning contents correct so feedback on training so these are some of the merits they have given listed of points under mission karma yogi these are the important key points what you can derive out of mission karma yogi so that is given in paragraph 2 so you have a feedback on training what is feedback of training means as civil servants once you finish of a training so government clearly knows that how effective is the training and is it useful the training model is what are changes can be done correct and co creation of training content is lot of training institutes can create a training content on a single topic because they have expertise in all domains okay so these are some of the benefits of this uh, mission karma yogi next thing is paragraph 1 2 and 3 so for ultimately this uh, civil service reform in training especially mission karma yogi comes under transformational changes so transformational changes is changes with has a huge impact that's called transformational changes especially in work culture especially in work culture and next thing is in uh, strengthening institutions strengthening institution public institutions institution means public institutions and use of modern technologies especially for training use of modern technologies okay and capacity building so why all this being done is ultimately to serve the people better we already saw the primary objective of reformers to make it more efficient and more accountable civil services so all these are being done in mission karma yogi to make it uh, viable that's going paragraph 1 and paragraph 2 so they have given some start, uh, facts that there are 60 plus 60 plus civil services under union government and state government 60 plus s means what they say iis ips irs audit and account services and we saw in 2016 19 they are creating new services all are cons- are 60 plus in the indian system okay so they are going to harmonize harmonize civil services so they are going to combine all the civil services and also to create a central talent pool so create a central talent pool at the disposal of the government so that is being the objective and also to match the to match the competency with a job profile what is competency with job profile means if you are an individual expert in certain area where that expert is required you need to match with the particular job so that is being done so that is the intention of all this reform process and ultimately what they say is uh, in paragraph 3 okay so right now we can see that existing civil services existing civil services entirely based on one time examination they are asked saying about this upsc examination once you clear this examination in the rest 30 years of life is taken care according to the government this creates a unique challenge for the system because the incentive for civil servant is to crack the examination get into the services what they want after that never think about the rest of the career so to avoid or to make changes in that particular existing system only we have this lot of reforms in mission karma yogi correct uh, which creates elitism that is what the problem so it creates elitism so elitism in civil services 
so to avoid all these things are uh, they are more going for mission karmi yogi so this is the last article so right now we go for a question so this is 2020 gs paper 2 question the question says about this uh, economic performance is based on institutional quality so in any society i'll just give the brief idea about the question i'll say the points for the question so the question says in the first statement any economic performance is entirely based on institutional quality so in any country's economic development there are institutions which play a major role it can be a banking institution or it can be a uh, capital markets and government is the most important institution so this institution character determines the economic performance that's a statement which is the first uh, line of the question you need to say that the institution these are the institutions which play a major role in economic performance of a society and their characters determines the outcome second part of the question is the most important thing so they are asking to give some reforms in civil services for strengthening democracy so based on this first statement they are asking with the ca main rating candidate what are the reforms can be done in civil services so already we saw that in our article civil service reforms as per niti ayog there are three major areas one is recruitment training and performance appraisal a performance evaluation there are three major areas what niti ayog ask for reforms in civil service that's the question being asked so what you want to do is what are the reforms being done in recruitment that should be the one paragraph reforms in training what we saw on mission karma yogi that is the next paragraph and reforms in performance evaluation can be the next one so if you are able to write this uh, uh, three major points the answer can be finished okay okay thank you